welcome to the lecture on admissions and confessions under the Indian Evidence Act and the Code of Criminal Procedure along with the latest developments by M. P. Siddhesh. This is part 2 of the lecture. In this lecture, we have the following learning objectives. Number 1. To understand the procedure related to the recording of statements by the police and confessions by the magistrate. And number two, we shall understand the evidentiary value of statements recorded by the police and their use in a trial with the help of relevant case law. Number three, we shall understand the interplay or the interaction between Evidence Act on one hand and the CRPC on other hand. And number four, finally, we shall understand and try to appreciate the changes that have been introduced by the latest laws, that is the Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyaman and the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Samhita. Therefore, we shall cover the following subtopics in this lecture. Number one, we shall look at section 164 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Next, we shall look at section 163 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. Moving on, we shall look at section 162 of the Criminal Procedure Code. Next, we shall understand some of the important cases pertaining to this topic which have been decided by the Honorable Supreme Court. Next, we shall be undertaking a comparative analysis of the relevant sections that we have seen so far from the Evidence Act and the latest Bharatiya Saksha Samhita. And finally, in the last subtopic of this lecture, we shall undertake a comparative analysis of the relevant sections from the Code of Criminal Procedure and the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Samhita. Let us start this lecture with the subtopic of section 164. Section 164 of the Code of Criminal Procedure deals with the recording of statements and confessions by the magistrate only during the course of an investigation. Next, it must be remembered that the provisions of section 164 are mandatory. It means that the magistrate must follow all the requirements given in this section. And finally, what is the objective of this section? There are two objectives of this section. Number one, to make confessions usable in a trial. And number two, to ensure that the confessions recorded under this section are voluntary in nature. Now, let us turn to some of the important features of section 164. Under section 164, recording of a confession or a statement may be conducted by the judicial magistrate or the metropolitan magistrate. This means that number one, the executive magistrate and number two, any police officer who has been conferred with the powers of the magistrate may not record a confession or a statement under this section. Next, please remember that this section only applies to statements recorded by the magistrate during the course of investigation. Now, what is the meaning of the word investigation in the context of criminal procedure? I want you to remember that investigation refers to all the procedures under this code for the collection of evidence by the police. According to the Apex Court, investigation consists of the following steps. Number one, proceeding to the spot of crime. Number two, ascertainment of the facts and circumstances of the case. Number three, the discovery and arrest of the accused. Number four, collection of evidence. And finally, formation of an opinion whether or not on the material collected the accused can be produced before a magistrate and whether a charge sheet may be submitted. All of the following are the steps of an investigation as mentioned by the Supreme Court. 
therefore this section only applies to statements and confessions recorded by the magistrate before the commencement of trial and only during the course of investigation as mentioned above next one of the features of section 164 is that the magistrate must warn the accused that he is not bound to make a confession and if he does so it may be used as evidence against him in a trial the magistrate must clearly mention that he is a magistrate and not a member of the police force if it is found that recording of a confession has been postponed to the next day a fresh warning by the magistrate becomes necessary this is by far the most important feature of section 164 because it assures the voluntariness of a confession another important feature of section 164 is the preliminary questions asked by the magistrate the magistrate must ask preliminary questions to the accused before recording his confession the accused must be asked about the reason for making a statement which is guaranteed to harm him along with the warning mentioned previously and discussed previously this is another feature designed to ensure that the confession recorded by the magistrate is voluntary next if at any time before the confession is recorded the accused states that he is not willing to make the confession the magistrate shall not authorize detention of such a person in police custody that is he shall not be remanded back to the police custody this is another safeguard to ensure that the confession recorded under section 164 is voluntary next let us take a look at some of the important conditions that must be satisfied by the magistrate while recording a confession or a statement under section 164 in order for that statement or that confession to be admissible as evidence in a trial so number 1 a confession recorded under section 164 has to be recorded in the manner provided by section 281 of the code of criminal procedure next statements other than confessions are supposed to be recorded as provided under section 272 to section 282 of the code of criminal procedure however in case of statements other than confessions the magistrate can change the method or the procedure of recording such statements according to the facts and circumstances of the particular case at hand and finally any rules issued by the high court regarding the recording of confessions and statements under section 164 must be followed by the magistrate now please refer to sections 272 to section 282 of the code for a better understanding of this section the intricacies and fine points of section 272 to 282 are frankly beyond the scope of this video so please also try to find out the rules regarding section 164 issued by the high court of your own state this will give you a better understanding of section 164 the question arises how are statements and confessions made under section 164 used in a trial please remember that unlike section 162 confessions and statements under section 164 may be used for both corroboration and contradiction next there is an exception to section 164 the magistrate does not have to follow all the rules like preliminary questions or the statutory warning which have been mentioned in section 164 in an inquiry under section 202 of the code so what happens if the magistrate does not follow all the conditions prescribed by section 164 what are the consequences for the prosecution 
well it must be remembered that non observance of conditions in section 164 raises doubts about the voluntary nature of the confession and thus the confession recorded without observing the rules under section 164 becomes irrelevant in a proceeding however this is only a procedural defect which may be cured therefore if it does not appear on record that the conditions of section 164 have been fulfilled the magistrate may depose before a court that the requirements prescribed under section 164 were in fact complied with even if it does not appear on record however please remember that only formal defects may be cured that is if a magistrate has indeed observed all the conditions but they still don't appear on record only such errors may be corrected or cured substantial defects cannot be cured under section 463 this means that if a magistrate has in fact not followed any of the conditions prescribed section 463 cannot come to his rescue and cannot save him and the confession so made becomes irrelevant in a proceeding so what is the effect if a confession is voluntary and does not suffer from any irregularities can conviction be based solely on a confession please remember that confession is an almost conclusive evidence against the maker the maker of a confession may be convicted based solely on a voluntary confession that does not suffer from any infirmity however as a matter of prudence the courts expect some corroboration before convicting based solely on a confession so what is the effect of a statement and not a confession recorded under section 164 it is extremely important to understand the difference between the effect of a confession and a statement under section 164 so in case of a statement under 164 it can be only used for the purpose of corroboration and contradiction it cannot be used as substantive evidence against the accused this position was taken by the supreme court in the case of the state of delhi and shri ram lohia now let us start with the sub topic of section 162 of the code of criminal procedure so what is the rationale behind the existence of section 162 what objectives does it serve it serves three objectives number 1 the police cannot be trusted to honestly record a statement often times police manipulate or modify the statement which is made to them in order to be favorable to the case of the prosecution and number 2 such modified statements are always prejudicial to the interests of the maker and finally number 3 section 162 also incorporates within itself the constitutional right of protection against self incrimination under article 20 sub clause 3 section 162 provides that the statements made to the police are not to be signed by the maker of those statements it also provides for situations in which such statements may be used during a trial it also provides an exception to the rules enumerated in section 162 in the form of section 27 and section 32 of the evidence act so where can the statements made to the police be used according to section 162 a statement made to the police if reduced into writing may be used by the defense and with the permission of the court or with the leave of the court by the prosecution to contradict a prosecution witness as provided under the second part of section 145 of the evidence act the second part of section 145 it must be remembered deals with contradiction it also provides that before contradicting a witness his attention must be drawn to the relevant portion of the statement intended 
to be contradicted. Therefore, this requirement under section 145 must be followed when using a statement as provided by section 162 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. So what actually happens when a statement is used under section 162? Let us try to understand with the help of an illustrative example. Imagine that A made a statement to the police among other things that he saw B stabbing C with the knife and this statement was reduced into writing by the police. Now in a trial against D, A is one of the prosecution witnesses. At the trial, the prosecution seeks to prove that D stabbed C with a knife. During the trial, A states that he saw D stabbing C with a knife. Here, D may use the statement made by A to the police in which he stated that he saw B stabbing C and not D stabbing C in order to contradict him as provided under section 145 of the Evidence Act. Now let us try and understand the exceptions to section 162. Statements falling under section 32 of the Evidence Act that is dying declarations and statements which lead to discovery of information under section 27 of the Evidence Act are excluded from the ambit of section 162. Thus, dying declarations made to the police and statements which lead to the discovery of relevant information may be used by the prosecution not only for contradiction but also for corroboration. Section 27 is the most misused section in the whole of Evidence Act. Many times the police stage recovery in order to use the statement made by a person and in order to get over the difficulties created by section 162. However, we shall discuss the lacunas within the Indian criminal justice system in some other lecture. For now, please only remember that section 27 is misused by the police in India. In the case of Raghumandan against the state of UP, the apex court has held that there are two more exceptions to section 162. Number one, under section 165 of the Evidence Act, the judge may ask any question, including questions covering the statement made to the police by the accused. And number two, under section 311 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, the court may use the statement made to the police by the accused during his examination. Let us start with the subtopic of section 163. According to this section, the police are not to offer any inducement as mentioned in section 24 of the Evidence Act. We have discussed section 24 of the Evidence Act in the previous part that is part 1 of this lecture. So, if for some reason you are not able to recall what section 24 is, that is not a problem. Simply pause this video, go back to the previous part, revise section 24 and then get back to this video. Next, section 163 also provides that no police officer or any other person shall prevent any person from making any statement which he may make voluntarily. Now what does that mean? It simply means that no police officer or any other person shall stop a person from making a statement that he wishes to do so on his own accord or voluntarily. Why has this section been included in the CRPC? This section has been included to give effect to section 24 of the Evidence Act and section 163 together with section 161 subsection 2 forms the right against self-incrimination as enshrined in the CRPC. Let us start with the subtopic of section 163. According to this section, the police are not to offer any inducement as mentioned in section 24 of the Evidence Act. We have discussed section 24 of the Evidence Act in the previous part that is part 1 of this lecture. So, if for some reason 
you are not able to recall what section 24 is, that is not a problem. Simply pause this video, go back to the previous part, revise section 24 and then get back to this video. Next, section 163 also provides that no police officer or any other person shall prevent any person from making any statement which he may make voluntarily. Now what does that mean? It simply means that no police officer or any other person shall stop a person from making a statement that he wishes to do so on his own accord or voluntarily. Why has this section been included in the CRPC? This section has been included to give effect to section 24 of the Evidence Act and section 163 together with section 161 subsection 2 forms the right against self-incrimination as enshrined in the CRPC. Now let us turn to some of the landmark cases pertaining to confessions and admissions. Let us start with the case of Tehsildar Singh against the state of UP. Like always, I have provided the citation for your quick reference. The facts of the case were as follows. A gang of decoits believed that two of them were acting as informants for the police. They attacked a gathering of people where the informers were supposed to be present. Three people died. Both the informants escaped alive. There were eight witnesses who clearly saw both the accused committing the offence. During the trial, the defence counsel sought to ask two questions to one of the witnesses during his cross-examination. The presiding judge, however, refused to allow the two questions by making a reasoned order and convicted both of the accused. So, essentially, the accused contended that by denying those two questions, the accused did not get an effective opportunity for cross-examination and hence the trial was unfair. Specifically, the accused claimed that number 1. Under section 145, the whole statement of the accused becomes open for cross-examination and not only for the purpose of contradiction but maybe also for corroboration. Number 2. The word contradiction is wide enough to include the word omission in it. There was another contention which is not relevant for us presently. So, what was the decision of the apex court? What was their thinking? What did they decide? The following questions were framed by the Supreme Court. Number 1. What is the true interpretation of the words in the manner provided by Section 145 Evidence Act? Number 2. What is the true interpretation of the words statement has been reduced into writing and to contradict? And finally, when does an omission amount to contradiction? In answer to the first question, the Apex Court has held that during an inquiry or trial, statements made to the police during the course of investigation may be only used for the purpose of contradiction as envisaged under Section 145 of the Evidence Act and for no other purpose. This is by far the most important aspect of this decision for our purposes. In answer to the second question, it was held that generally speaking, omissions cannot be part of statements. However, it may be necessary to imply words into a statement that have not been expressly stated in order to make a statement self-consistent and sensible. Such an implication is permitted only in the following cases. Number one. The doctrine of recital by necessary implication. Number two, when the statement is in a positive tone and the deposition may be in a negative tone. And finally, when the principle of inherent repugnancy becomes applicable. In only these situations is an omission.
permitted to be read into a statement i hope that much is clear and finally the supreme court held that there exists a contradiction between two statements when both of them are so inconsistent that they cannot coexist so what was the end result in the end the appeal of the accused was dismissed and the high court's decision which upheld the conviction by the lower court was confirmed let us move on to the case of nazir ahmed against king emperor let us understand the facts of this case first of all this was a pre constitutional case in 1936 when this case was decided the old code of criminal procedure 1898 was still in force section 164 of the old code corresponds to section 164 of the 1973 code with very little change in wording so this is still a relevant decision for our purposes now what happened what happened in this case a robbery took place in a village the villagers tried to stop the robbers the robbers shot back and one villager was wounded and killed the appellant and some other men were apprehended later for that robbery they had not been identified at the stage of the robbery a camel driver had identified them later on and a magistrate acting under the orders of the district magistrate visited the scene of the robbery along with the accused in handcuffs the magistrate deposed before the sessions court that the accused had confessed to him about participating in the robbery and also to firing a revolver during pursuit he produced a note containing the substance of the confession of which he gave oral evidence on the other hand the accused denied having ever made a confession to the magistrate so the following two questions were framed by the privy council number 1 what is the legal implication of the word may which appears in section 164 and number 2 whether oral evidence of a magistrate regarding confession is admissible or not in answer to the first question it was held that the word may which appears in section 164 cannot mean must a magistrate is obviously not under any obligation to record a confession of a self accusing lunatic or if it serves no purpose at all in answer to the second question the privy council held that the rule which applies is that where a power is given to do a certain thing in a certain way that thing must be done in that way or not be done at all therefore when a magistrate records a statement under section 164 all the procedural requirements enumerated in section 164 must be complied with other methods of performing the same task that is recording a confession are forbidden when a minute procedure has been laid down in section 164 itself it would be a stretch of interpretation to hold that any other procedure was permitted why because if any other procedure was allowed it would have the effect of rendering the procedure laid down with such minuteness in section 164 as mere empty words that means it will take away all the force from section 164 therefore ultimately it was held that the trial court should have excluded the oral evidence of the magistrate because oral evidence of a magistrate regarding a confession made is inadmissible in the result appeal was allowed and conviction was set aside in the similar post independence case of singhara singh against the state of up the supreme court has held that the nazir ahmed case was correctly decided and that oral evidence of a magistrate to prove a confession is still inadmissible and finally 
let us discuss the case of Nandini Satpati against P. L. Dani. This case actually pertains to the investigation procedure and section 161 of the code which deals with power of police to require attendance before them and questioning by the police. However, the right against self-incrimination comes into play in both section 162 and also section 164. In case of section 162, the statement to the police is not to be signed and in case of section 164, the magistrate cannot administer an oath before recording confessions. Both amount to self-incrimination which is forbidden. Therefore, in discussing this case, our only objective is to understand the scope and the effect of the right against self-incrimination which is guaranteed by the Indian Constitution. Please remember that we shall discuss the decision in this case in greater detail when we deal with investigation procedures, the rights of an accused and the rights of an arrestee. However, for now, it is important to remember the ratio of the court in this case. Number one, the guarantee under Article 20 sub clause 3 is available to every person against whom an FIR has been registered. Number two, remote apprehensions of self-incrimination are irrelevant. Now what does that mean? This means that immunity from self-incrimination cannot be used as a pretense not to answer relevant questions by the police. Next, the appellant shall answer all questions which are non-incriminatory. If he or she claims immunity regarding any question, he shall briefly state the case in which he believes that he may be incriminated by answering the refused question. And finally, after questioning, if the officer believes that the immunity against self-incrimination under Article 20, Subclause 3 has been used as an excuse not to answer relevant question. He is free to prosecute the accused under Section 179 of the Indian Penal Code. Now, let us start with the final subtopic of this lecture, that is, the comparative analysis of the old laws with the newly introduced Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyaman and the Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Samhita which will replace the old laws very, very soon. First, let us make some general observations about the new laws before dealing with the specifics. So, broadly speaking, the Indian Criminal Justice Administration suffers from the following problems. Number one, lack of rights for victims and lack of a victim protection program or lack of victim protection measures. Number two, jails being overcrowded with under trial prisoners number 3 custodial torture remains one of the major problems and one of the major concerns in the whole system and finally some colonial offenses are still existent on the law books even after 75 years of independence well a few steps have been taken towards addressing these chronic issues some of the important changes are as follows. Number one, now under the new laws, an FIR may be registered at any police station irrespective of where the crime took place. Number two, it is now the responsibility of the jail superintendent to apply for the release of under trial prisoners who have served half or one third of their maximum permissible sentences. Number three, According to the new clause or section 118, torture with a view to elicit or extort a confession has been made an offence. And finally, certain colonial offences like suicide and unnatural intercourse and even adultery have finally disappeared from the statute books. All of these are welcome changes. However, there can be a huge gap between theory 
and practice. Therefore, time will be the best judge of these new laws. Now, let us turn to the changes introduced by the new laws into the specific sections of the Evidence Act and the Code of Criminal Procedure. Let us start our comparative analysis with the Evidence Act. Please take a moment to go through the table given in this slide to understand the new section numbers or the new clause numbers. So, clause 15 to 18 correspond to the old section 17 to 20 of the Evidence Act and there have been no changes at all in these sections. Old sections have been reproduced into the new laws. Moving on, we can see that there is only one change in the wording of section 24 under the old Evidence Act. The word coercion has been added to inducement, offer and threat. Now, coercion has been defined in the context of Contract Act as doing or threatening to do any of the offences which are made punishable by the Indian Penal Code. Now, the first question is, is the same definition which is used in the context of Contract Act applicable in the context of a criminal proceeding? The answer to this question is still unknown. Now, the next question is, are the police or other functionaries under the code capable of coercion as defined in the context of Contract Act? Is the legislature finally recognizing that even the government may commit coercion? Or has this word been simply added as ample precaution? Only time will tell. In my opinion, the addition of the word coercion will not have any noticeable impact on the functioning of the old section 24, that is the new clause 22 of the Bharatiya Saksha Adhiniyaman. Now, moving on. Let us compare the Code of Criminal Procedure with the newly introduced Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Samhita. There are no changes in section 162 and section 163. The new sections are exact replicas of the old sections under the Code of Criminal Procedure. However, new provisions have been added in clause 183 which is intended to replace section 164. We shall take a look at those changes in the next two slides. The additions made by the new law to section 164 of the old code have been reproduced on the screen for your reference. Please take a moment to pause the video and read the additions that have been made in the old section 164. It will be clear that the new clauses have been introduced with a view to protecting the dignity of women victims in case of certain offences. This is a novel and welcome feature that was not present before in the old code. That is all. There are no other significant changes to the old laws apart from nomenclature changes and grammatical changes. Thank you for watching. We upload two new videos every Tuesday and Saturday. If you would like me to cover a particular revision topic, please comment below and I shall try to cover it as far as possible. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you like the content. Thank you once again.